Now, it's not a new debate, but it seems to have gained currency as groups such as ISIS and Boko Haram espouse a very male reading of the Quran, where women appear to have no rights to freedom, education or personal choice at all. Is it possible for Islam to undergo a reformation in the opposite direction and introduce a feminist reading of the book? Well, Zara Huda Faris is a Muslim researcher at the Muslim Debate Initiative. Ziba Mir Hosseini is one of the authors of Men in Charge, Rethinking Authority in Muslim Legal Tradition, and she joins us from Cambridge. Ziba, one of the contributors to your book suggests ISIS could be the salvation of women. Why? Yes, it is Amina Badud who says ISIS is a wake-up call. In fact, ISIS is a wake-up call to all of us because it shows how extremist group distort a religious tradition and its textual sources to justify violence and worst kind of uh, atrocities. So what just ISIS is doing in the name of Islam is so outrageous and it is so perverse. It's in in its interpretation of Islam, which really goes against the spirit of the religion that is bringing a kind of consensus among the vast majority of Muslims that they need to go back to their textual tradition and rethink the established interpretations and the position of women in line with the contemporary notion of justice. And gender equality is part of contemporary notions of justice. And there can't be a justice without equality. Zara, let let, let me put that point to to Zara, Ziba. It's a wake-up call, Zara, demanding a reinterpretation of the text. Well, <clears throat> many would say that ISIS are, are reinterpreting the text for themselves and they are not only, um, you know, uh, perhaps um, uh, brutal and, and violent towards women, but to men too. I mean, their interpretation is widely rejected. And so the question of reinterpretation and reformation or the wake-up call is not something new. This is something that Muslims have been um grappling with for a long time, but it's not about reformation. It's about reviving the text originally as they um, have been lived and practiced throughout centuries, which is not what ISIS is doing, unfortunately. I think what is more outrageous is the dichotomy that is painted, um, which is that somehow ISIS is the only alternative um, when this is, you know, a new aberration within in, within uh, our our living history, um, and for the vast majority of Islamic history, we've had a very prosperous and beautiful. Um, up until maybe you know this this century, a very beautiful and and prosperous environment in which um, women uh, have have flourished uh, to no end. I mean, uh, the scholarship of Islam, for example, is is heavy with female scholars. So there are at least eight thousand documented. Not only that, but male scholars who who have been at the forefront of pioneering Islamic texts have taken um, and learned from uh, female scholars of the past. Yes, so Zeba, Zeba, where where is the source? of the idea that men are in charge that you feel needs reinterpreting? Of course, I, uh, the source of the idea is patriarchal interpretation of the Quran. Uh, we must make a distinction between uh, Sharia, which in Muslim belief is the perfect law, it's the way to justice, and also the interpretation of the Sharia. The source is Muslim legal tradition, jurisprudence. Uh, yes, women are have been there and uh, as part of the tradition, but we must not forget that by the time that uh, schools of jurisprudence, which is known as fiqh, emerged, women's voices were silent. And their interests were not reflected in the law. And, and ISIS, it is true that it is the product of decades of political dictatorship in Iraq and Syria and the Western military intervention in the region. And it is true that it is, but uh, its um, interpretation is rejected by Muslims. But we must not forget that it is also the product of the spread of deeply conservative Wahhabi and Salafi interpretation of Islam, which has spread among Muslims. And there is no denial that 
there are patriarchal interpretations of Islam, and these patriarchal interpretations need to be uh, to be addressed. And that is what feminist voices and scholarship in in, in Islam are doing. So, they have so, emerged so, hang on. because let, of let, the let context. Let me let me put that point to to Zara. How would you deal, for instance, Zara, with the idea that in Sharia law, a woman's word is worth less than a man's? Well, that's not true. <laughs> so, for example... But we know in a lot of societies it is. No, let's, for, so let's go to... The, let's look at two things. So the first thing would be the text, and the second would be what's practised in modern societies today. Now, um, to start with the second and work our way back, modern societies today are not based on um, Islamic systems or Islamic governance or Islamic <clears throat> uh, law... Uh, uh, exclusively, uh, for example, Pakistan, or many of the Muslim countries are actually secular countries that have a little bit of, um, you know, Islamic um, uh, laws applied. But because they're applied in a sort of piecemeal fashion, you end up with the sort of injustices that we see today. With regards to the testimony, um, this is often misconstrued and often uh, are used to say, oh, that women are, are, are lesser than men. Um, it's not the case. There are plenty of examples in which, for example, the testimony of the woman is equal to that of the man. So, for example, in a marriage, if a, if a man accuses his wife of something and she says, no, I did not do this, they cancel, they cancel each other out. The only circumstance in which the Qur'an posited that a woman's testimony, you needed two for one man, was only in those circumstances of financial transactions. And that's actually within the verse itself. It's not something that's been extrapolated later. And that was only because, at the time, women were less involved in financial transactions. In other affairs, for example, um, the medical care or the things in which uh, women were more involved, uh, you, you, oftentimes you would need more male witnesses compared to female witnesses. So I think one of the main issues with perhaps this positing of, of a feminist or the need for a feminist interpretation is that it doesn't correctly depict or represent, and we owe it to ourselves, if not uh, the Muslims as theologians, but as historians, to depict not only the texts and the and the traditions correctly in a balanced way, um, but also not to bring uh, alternative predispositions that might colour the way we look at our texts. So, Ziba, there's no need for reinterpretation. This is this is there is a need for interpretation, reinterpretation, and there has always been need uh, the process of reinterpretation going on. The fact is, feminism is for me is. Uh, about dignity of women, about um, being able to make dignified choices. And we must really look at the reality on the ground. We mustn't really talk about these idealized notions. Yes, we all agree that Islam is for justice. But the question is, this justice of Islam, has, has it been reflected in the laws? And we see it has not. And male authority, it is there. And uh, and feminism is also a knowledge project. It gives us the tool in the sense of how do we know what we know about women and family law in, in Islam? Because the fact is that Islam does not speak. People speak for Islam, and well, there are different interpretations. And the dominant interpretation of the Sharia, now that you we can see it in all legal systems, is putting women under male authority. Ziba Mir Husseini and Zara Huda Faris there. We must end. Thank you both very much indeed for being with us.